Welcome to the Long March Forward. I'm Margaret from Civic Nebraska's Voting Rights Team. And today, we're looking at Shelby versus Holder, a historic decision by the Supreme Court that has had swift repercussions for voters across the country. We'll first get our bearings by considering how Nebraska fares in use of constitutional language preserving voting rights in comparison to other states. Failure to ratify Nebraska's first constitution, drafted in 1866, resulted in a second constitution, which was ratified in October of 1875. This version became known as the Grasshopper Constitution for concurring with a plague of grasshoppers that descended upon the state at the same time. The 1875 constitution included several amendments creating such unique features as the nation's only unicameral legislative body. With explicit language protecting voting rights in Section 22, the Nebraska Constitution states, all elections shall be free and there shall be no hindrance or impediment to the right of a qualified voter to exercise the elective franchise. Nebraska is one of 26 states prioritizing the civic participation of its citizens. Not all states offer such safeguards. Arizona, for example, defines participation in the electoral process in terms of who is not allowed to participate. On the national level, with no federal voting standard, the Voting Rights Act of 1965 became an important protection to ensure the voting capital of people living in districts with a history of race-based voter discrimination, like poll taxes and literacy tests. It sought to prevent the creation of further barriers to their ballot access. Although black residents were at the time 45% of Alabama's total population prior to the Voting Rights Act of 1965, only 23% of eligible black voters in Alabama were registered. In an attempt to rectify such disparities, just two years after implementation of the Voting Rights Act, registration rates for black voters in Alabama increased to over 50%. Section 4 of the Act contained a coverage formula which determined what districts would have to pre-clear changes to their election rules with the federal government. Under this formula, five states were entirely covered jurisdictions. Alabama, Alaska, Georgia, Louisiana, Mississippi, South Carolina, and Virginia. In partially covered states, the special provisions applied only to identified counties. Shelby v. Holder will gain infamy for overturning this provision of the Voting Rights Act Prior to the landmark case, the act had been reauthorized by Congress five times with large bipartisan support. Recruited and funded by the Project on Fair Representation, a fringe legal defense fund that seeks to eliminate race-based legal protections, Shelby County, Alabama sued the federal government, then represented by Attorney General Eric Holder. Opening arguments before the U.S. Supreme Court began on February 27, 2013. The court ruled by a slim margin of 5 to 4 that Section 4 of the Voting Rights Act was unconstitutional as it was based on data that was over 40 years old. In her dissenting opinion, Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg wrote, Throwing out preclearance when it has worked and is continuing to work to stop discriminatory changes is like throwing away your umbrella in a rainstorm because you are not getting wet. Since 2014, obstacles to ballot access have increased across the country with roughly 1,700 polling locations closed in just its first four years. States have further reduced the ability to vote early and by mail, purged voter rolls, and enacted identification requirements on Election Day at polling locations. Nebraska now faces its most serious threat to ballot access with a petition drive that would place a proposed change to our Constitution, adding the phrase, before casting a ballot in any election, a qualified voter shall present valid photographic identification in a manner specified by the legislature to ensure the preservation of an individual's rights under this Constitution and the Constitution of the United States. With its use of vague, nebulous language, the proposed amendment would force Nebraska voters to surmount a costly and cumbersome hurdle equal in height to that of only seven other states. It contains no definitions detailing how it will impact the very Nebraskans we have heard from in this series, including those in military service overseas, rural voters facing poor broadband coverage, and extremely limited DMV hours of operation. How will it impact all Nebraskans' ability to vote by mail, especially in our most remote counties, 11 of which hold their elections exclusively by mail? No provisions are included to protect the rights of people experiencing homelessness or facing mobility issues. 
As a caregiver, it will be an added burden to myself and my own octogenarian parents, neither of whom possess a current state-issued photo ID. We must also mention the voters of color, the very people these laws are crafted to discourage from participating in our elections. All means all. In Nebraska, that still counts for something. We are bound together under a state motto of equality before the law. Throughout this series, I have been joined by Nebraskans of diverse backgrounds who have articulately and passionately responded to the question, what does voting mean to you? To all who are watching, I submit this question to you now. What does voting mean to you? To me, voting is getting to contribute and have a say in the society where I live, the place where I raise my children. Um, getting to vote means getting to play a part in democracy and be the basic foundation of it, the people. What does voting mean to you? You can leave your response in the comments. Are we ready to erase 146 years of tradition, which so highly values the participation of every Nebraskan citizen that our founders established and we maintain a house that belongs not to our representatives, but to we, the people ourselves? In this, our state stands alone. There is truly no place like Nebraska. Our country's long march for voting rights began 233 years ago. Both acknowledging and celebrating this history reveals that momentum has not always carried us forward towards full civic participation. But to rectify this, Americans have continued to step forward to bring us ever nearer that goal. My fellow members of the People's House, now is the time for us to stand and march alongside those who have journeyed to carry us this far. The march continues. Visit civicnebraska.org to join our ranks.